So now if you grab your, your Bible, we'll turn to our text today from the book of 1 Timothy. And, and we're wrapping up a section of 1 Timothy, even though it's at the beginning of, of chapter uh, 6, um, that what we see today is this continuation of the theme of honor, that back in chapter 5 we saw Paul telling uh, the church, and Timothy specifically, how to honor widows in the church. And then he talked about how to honor elders within the church. And now he is talking about how bond servants are to honor their masters. And so again, this is the book of First Timothy, chapter 6, and I'll just be reading two verses, verses 1 and 2. Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of turn the page, the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must, must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are believers, are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I thank you. I, I praise you for your grace to the, to the Coco family. And Lord, I thank you for bringing them to, to Hope Church and, and just their, their witness of, of love and, and service and humility. And, and Father, today as we come to the, the preaching of the words, we come to this text from 1 Timothy, uh, we pray that you would guide our discussion, that you would guide me as I teach and preach, that, that you would move us in our hearts and, and guide us to a correct understanding of what you have here and then a correct application of it for our lives. And so, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this text, depending on which translation you use, it, it uses the word bondservant, or, or some translations will use the word slavery, the instruction to a slave in the church. And of course, we know that the institution of slavery has been almost universal in every culture in human history, tragically. That, that you, you see it in society around the world. And, and quite often, people have had a hard time imagining a world without slavery. Often society has sought to only regulate the excesses of, of slavery. But then as you think about the, the history of the church, you, you tragically see examples of people defending slavery or attempting to defend slavery from the Bible, arguing that it's, it's biblical or that it's right or that it's, you know, it's acceptable. But then you also see that the seed of Christianity in, in making slavery unthinkable, the, the, the seed that uh, led many in the abolition movement to try to abolish slavery on the, the grounds of scriptural principle of humanity, uh, of us all being created in the image of God. And today we won't be able to get into a discussion of every aspect of the Bible's teaching on slavery. That there's a lot that could be said here. So we're going to try to really focus on what Paul is saying here in these two verses. What is he saying and then drawing out what it means for us today in our context as well. And so look again in your Bible at verse 1. Paul says, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters of, as worthy of honor. And there's that word honor that we've seen back in chapter 5. Now, when Paul talks about bond servants, he's using the word, the Greek word doulos. And this is a word that is just notoriously difficult to translate into English, that, that translators always struggle with what to do with the word doulos. Because if you render it servant, as some translations do, maybe you're looking at a translation that uses the word servant, uh, that's not a bad translation, but it can cause some misunderstanding because usually when you think of a servant, you're thinking of somebody who can quit. If he doesn't like his boss, he can quit and move on to another job. You also think that he's receiving some sort of a salary, some sort of wages for his labor. 
That's not what we think of when we hear the word servant. But this word was, was different, that, that the, the due losses we'll discuss didn't receive wages, and that he was owned or she was owned by a master, that, that the labors of the due loss did not belong to the, to the due loss. And so when you think of that, it, it's a little less like we think of a servant and more like we think of a slave in the way we use the word. So maybe then you're using a translation that uses the word slave instead of the word servant. And that's also not a, a bad translation, that, that there's reasons why you would translate it that way. But if the translator goes that way and, and translates it as servant, then it opens up another possible misunderstanding, especially as American readers in our context. Because when we hear the word slave or the word slavery, we think of the institution of slavery as it was practiced in the New World. We think of slavery in the South leading up to the Civil War. And we think of a, of a slavery that was often based on race, that was large-scale chattel slavery. But when you, when you look at what slavery was in the Greco-Roman world, it was very different from slavery as it was practiced quite often in the New World. And so here, here's a few facts about slavery in the Greco-Roman world. The, the first is that, that slavery in the Greco-Roman world at the, the time of the New Testament was it based primarily on race or the color of one's skin? Well, that makes it different from how we think of slavery often today. The second thing is that slavery in the Greco-Roman world uh, was less permanent. And part of that was connected to the fact, the fact that it wasn't based on race. That, that if there are examples historically of people buying their own freedom from slavery or being set free by a benevolent master, and once they were free, they were often had the ability to move up in society, to, to enter even the, the upper levels of society in certain cases. And so it was, it was a less permanent socioeconomic standing. But then finally, it was very, very common in the Greco-Roman world. A, a biblical encyclopedia says that in large cities such as Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus, and remember that's where Timothy is ministering in Ephesus, but also in Antioch, as many as one third of the population was legally slave, were, were slaves, and one third had been slaves earlier in life. And so, so you see one third of the whole population of the town or the city is a slave, and another one third uh, were formerly enslaved. And, and so this would have been uh, very, very common. And, and you think of Timothy ministering here in Ephesus, that he probably the majority of his church would have been either current slaves or former slaves. And many of the, the slaves in society were not simply working on farms or brute labor, but also uh, the, the doulos was often a skilled craftsman, or they were educated in reading and writing, or they were scribes, or they were teachers, uh, which also gave them more social mobility after they were freed from slavery. Now, I'm not saying that slavery as it, practiced, as it was practiced in the Greco-Roman world was good or that it should be emulated, but it's important to see the differences from what we think of as slavery in the word today. So that's why, you know, some say servant, some say slave. The ESV that I read from today uses the word bondservant. Of course, the disadvantage of using the word bondservant is that no one knows what a bondservant is, <laughs> uh, and, and we just tend not to use that word very often, but Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as one bound to service without wages. And so that, that is, captures the idea fairly well, that to bound to service without wages. But regardless of how you, you translate it, there are arguments for how you translate the word and how you understand it. But then we, we, we face the very important question as we reflect on the question of, of slavery. What does the New Testament think of the institution of slavery or bond servitude as it was practiced in the Greco-Roman world? What is the attitude of the New Testament? Again, we can't talk about all of the texts that deal with this question. But what we can say is that the New Testament, when it comes to the question of slavery in the ancient world, was both extremely revolutionary, but then also anti-revolutionary. 
And so it was, it was, on the one hand, it's revolutionary because of the equality that it offered to people who were free and who were slave. You can think of Galatians 3, where Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. So racial division within the church breaks down and the unity that we have in Christ. He says there is neither slave nor free. So the, the distinction of slave and free breaks down within the church, that we are all one in Christ, that we have equal dignity within the church, that we have equal standing before the Lord. And when that message entered the Greco-Roman world, that would have been revolutionary. And that's why often the, the Romans would make fun of early Christians because they say that's just a, a religion for women and slaves. And of course, as Christians, we take that as a compliment uh, because what they were seeing is that it was a religion for those who were often marginalized in that society, that, that people found dignity and respect within the church. And so you can think of another letter in the New Testament that deals with slavery uh, is the, the letter of the Apostle Paul to a man named Philemon. Paul is writing to Philemon because he had formerly had a, a bond servant who had run away and had refused to work. And the, the bond servant named Onesimus had met Paul, converted to Christianity, became a, a faithful servant of Christ. And so Paul is then sending Onesimus back to Philemon, and he's instructing Philemon how he should deal with Onesimus. And he says when he, when he comes back, receive him not just as a bondservant, but receive him as a brother in Christ which is itself revolutionary to, to the sense of you're, you're taking him back as a, as a brother in Christ. And I remember in seminary, I had to write a paper on Philemon where why doesn't Paul condemn the institution of slavery in Philemon? Why doesn't he tell Philemon that he shouldn't have had a bondservant to begin with? We can wish that he would have said that, but, but this is where then, then you get into the, the, the other side of the coin. Because I said Christianity was extremely revolutionary but it was also, in a sense, anti-revolutionary. And let me explain what I, what I mean by that. That, that when, you, when you came to the ministry of Jesus, Jesus ministered to people. He, he, he offered hope and eternal hope. But his theme over and over again was that his kingdom was, was not of this world. And so he didn't lead a political revolution against the authorities. He didn't encourage a slave revolt. And even there were, there were slave revolts in the Greco-Roman world at various times, but, but the early church didn't encourage a, a violent overthrow of the institution as it was practiced in that time. And in fact, what you see in texts like our text today is Paul instructing bond servants to actually honor their, their masters. And and you say, well, well, why is this? And I, and I think that, that, that what it's getting at is, is not an, approve, an approval of the institution of slavery, but recognizing that, that real change can't start from the outside in, but it often and always starts from the inside out. And, I, and I, I appreciated what a study Bible said in its note on our text today. This is from the Reformation Heritage Study Bible. If you like the King James Bible, that's a, it's a great study Bible. Uh, but it, it, So the Reformation Heritage Study Bible says that Paul gives directions for slaves and masters. As such, Paul does not outlaw slavery, but provides a framework within which masters and their slaves must operate on the basis of mutual respect, love, and trust. Thereby, in reality, the institution of slavery is undermined. In our day, slave, the slave trade is forbidden, but pride antagonism against other people, races, uh, and those different of different social, social status, as well as foreigners, is deeply ingrained in the human heart. Paul points out to us the Christian attitude of love, respect, and care toward all people. And so you see then what, what that's saying is, is that that what it, what it does, what, what the Apostle Paul does and what the New Testament does is in a sense, it's, it's, it's like something that if there is a, a DNA of slavery, that, that the, 
the gospel comes in and totally changes the DNA so that the entire thing comes unraveled, that, that the whole institution unravels, that, it, that the gospel provides a solid death blow to the institution of slavery, as we've seen so often with it being led by Christians, but, but by, by also addressing the human heart in, in the way that, that it's not just don't enslave this person, but actually receive them as a brother in Christ, treat them with the dignity and honor as one is, who's a fellow heir of the kingdom of God. So look again at verse 1 in your, in your Bible. He says, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters of worthy as worthy of honor. And Paul says this elsewhere in, as he's dealing with relations within the church. In Ephesians 6, 5, he says, Bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. In Colossians 3, 22, he says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Then in Titus 2 9, he says, Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. And then the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2 18 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Now, of course, Christians throughout history who've tried to justify the institution of slavery often will appeal to texts like these. And I think that that's a wrong application because Paul's not thereby condoning enslavement of others. But yet he's facing the reality of people within his church who are in, who are bond servants who are who are facing this condition of slavery. What how what can they do? Should they violently rise up against their their owners? Should they throw off the burden? Should they run away? And, and Paul's saying that that no, that they they are to seek to honor those who are in authority over them, and that has implications for us as well. We may not have the, the practice of bond servitude in modern society. We may not have the institution of slavery, thankfully, though, of course, we did talk a few months ago about human trafficking that is still pro prominent. And it's interesting that in chapter one, Paul includes enslavers in the list of profound sins. And so Paul, even there, was condemning enslavement. Um, but, but here... As, as, we, as we think about this text, we, we realize that, wait, this is talking about showing honor to someone who is in authority over you, and that we have people who are in authority in our lives. It could be a professor if you're a student who is in authority in your life. It could be a supervisor who is in authority. It could be a boss who is in authority, that we have different places where we have an employer, someone who is in authority over us. And so the question is, how do we behave? Do we throw off the authority or do we seek to, to honor them, to seek to be respectful? And so you can think about this, whether you're a student or whether you have an employer or a supervisor, what does it look like to honor the spirit of 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2? And what it looks like is you don't gossip about your boss. You don't talk about your boss when he's not around. Uh, you, you don't join in the, the banter around the water fountain where people are talking about the boss and the supervisor. You, you don't work harder only when the boss is watching. You don't waste time at work on social media that you seek to be faithful, to serve diligently and Paul shows us why this is so important, because look again at verse 1. He says, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. And you say, why? Why should we do this? So that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Why should the bondservant honor the master? Why should the employer honor the Sorry, the employee honor the employer. Why should the student honor the professor? And, and the reason is, it says, for the sake of the holiness of the name of God and for the honor of the teaching of the gospel as it goes out into the world. Because as you consider your life, if you have 
unbelieving friends or coworkers or or family that that they are watching to see how you conduct yourself in life. And one of the important aspects of that witness before the watching world is the way that we deal with people who are in authority over us. Do we show respect? Do we work hard? Are we diligent? Do we gossip? Do we slander? Or do we seek to be diligent and to have that silent witness to the world around us? That is what we're called to. And it says in verse 2 that even if your boss is a believer, that you're supposed to still work hard and even harder. He says in verse 2, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So you think of in the ancient context, what happens if the, the bond servant and the master are both members of the same church? And because of the equality that was practiced in the church, I mean, the bond servant could be the elder within the church. And so in, the, in one passage, you could have, you could have a, a master within the church who has to submit to his bond servant as an elder within the church. But then you figure, what, how does that carry over into society then as a whole? That, that, that we are, Paul tells the, the bond servants, the, the masters in Colossians 4, that they are to show love and care and, and to, to not abuse their role. But then here he says that, that, that rather than saying we're, we have equality in Christ, we're, I, I don't have to work hard, I don't have to be diligent, that he's saying no, that if, if they're a believer, work even harder, be even more diligent and, and pray that there will be that relationship of mutual love and respect and, and care that undermines the whole institution of slavery as it has been practiced throughout history. And of course, this has implications for us as well, that maybe your boss or your professor or your supervisor is a believer. And you could be tempted to say, oh, well, I don't really have to, to work that hard because he'll cut me slack because he knows that I'm a believer. But he say, no, work even harder, be even more faithful, be even more diligent. But as you think about this, this call that we see here, it's hard. It would have been hard for bond servants. It's hard for us as well to, to really have this kind of honor for those in authority, this kind of humility, this kind of faithfulness. And, the, and so where do we get the strength and the power to be able to actually do what this text is calling us to do? Of course, you remember that, that the Apostle Paul loved to identify himself as a bond servant, that when he introduced himself in his letters, he almost always would identify himself as as Paul, the, the doulos Jesu Christi, uh, that he is the, the servant, the bond servant of Christ Jesus. Because he used to be a slave of sin and of death, but he recognized that, that he had been purchased by Christ, that, that he no longer belonged to himself, that his labors were not his own, that, that he belonged to his faithful master, the Lord Jesus Christ, his faithful Lord but that the service of Christ to become a slave of righteousness, a slave of Christ, is ultimate freedom, that it, it purchases freedom. And, and when we experience that freedom in Christ because we've been purchased through his life and his death and his resurrection, that we then have the, the freedom to serve, the, the freedom to submit to those in authority, the, the freedom to be diligent, the freedom to work hard, because we're not doing that out of a sense of servile obligation, but we're doing it as a response to being servants of Christ, knowing that, that we are free, that our, our identity isn't in our work. It's not in our submission to those in authority, but our identity is in Christ and his life and his death and his resurrection and the power and hope and peace that we experience through Jesus and through him alone and what he gave us through the cross. That is what we look to whenever we seek to serve and seek to love in the world around us. Let's pray. Father, we, we pray, we ask that you would give us hearts that are revolutionary, Father, that, that see the, the ultimate overthrow of the current world order through Christ, that, that we're looking forward to the day when he will when he will return in glory to judge the living and the dead, and that on that day there'll be an end of, of all sin, all hatred, all 
that is wrong in our world. And Father, I, I pray though that at the same time that as we are in this world that we wouldn't tolerate injustice, but we would also recognize what we're actually able to do, how we can be witness to the name of Christ. And I pray that we can witness for the name of Christ, not through, through violence, uh, not through anger, but that we could follow the, the pattern of our Savior Jesus, that we could follow the pattern of humility and the pattern, pattern of service that our Savior practiced. And Father, we pray that as we trust in him, as we see ourselves being transferred from being slaves of sin and death and the devil to be slaves of Christ, that, that we would see him as our, as our loving, benevolent Lord who gives us ultimate freedom. And we pray out of that freedom for strength to honor those in authority in our lives, to, to give respect where respect is due, honor where honor is due. Uh, that we would respect our, our governing authorities, our bosses, our supervisors. And Lord, we pray that we would keep our eye on why we're doing it, that we would have the, the silent witness of our deeds going out to the world, that we would not dishonor your name. We, we know from Scripture that the name of God is often blasphemed among the Gentiles because of us. But we pray that that would not be the case, that the people would take notice of the way that we serve, the way we love, uh, the way we speak, the way we comport our, our lives in the world. Uh, but we pray that, that through that witness, that more would turn to Jesus, would see him as their Lord, as their master, and see themselves as, as nothing but bond servants of Christ set free to serve. And so, Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.